Thank you everyone for handing in your briefings. Um, we're almost done. So congratulations on that. I'm going to say a little bit more about the briefings in a second. I'm going to go over some logistical stuff. Um, you'll be getting homework, homework three grades and the key are posted. Uh, you'll be getting them back at the end of next lecture because we don't want to have, we're going to do a scrum like last time at the end of this lecture, so we don't want to have too many papers flying around. I'm having my office hours today at 4 o'clock, not at 12.30. I have to go experiment on students. So um, that'll be happy. If someone asked me about my office hours on Thursday, uh, normal time, I think. Normal time is? 3.30. Unless I cancel them, and I'm not sure. Oh, so it's not usually after No. Uh, Thursday is usually 3.30. Um, the evaluations are going on right now in sections for your uh, GSIs, so uh, that's uh, hopefully something you're enjoying doing. Uh, and we should all be thankful to Faye for uh, doing all of the grading on homework three. Uh, of course, there might be mistakes, which of course are my problem, not his. Just kidding, they're his problem. But anyway, uh, they've been putting in a good uh, amount of work. And as we wind down the semester, um, hopefully you guys will be... Uh, getting the last tidbits of help from the GSI. So Diana is sorting out all the briefings right now. Uh, my evaluations will come out. Are you guys will be doing those on the last class on, th on next Tuesday, a week from today? Um, the final exam is on the fifteenth. It is not here. The final exam is in the room called Fifty Birds, B I R G E Hall. That's just up the hill from uh, the clock tower, yeah? Next to the Kant. I've never been there, but I'm sure I'll find my way there. Here is the format of the final exam. It's the same as the midterm exam, except a little longer. Which actually means that given that you have three hours instead of 80 minutes, you should have plenty of time. We're making it 50% longer, okay? There will be about 15 true-false explained questions. 15 or 16, and there will be about uh, uh, eight long answer uh, qualitative, quantitative questions, similar to your homework questions, okay? So uh, here's the bad news. Guess what? It's cumulative. So the weight, the predominant weight is going to be on material after the midterm. However, there will be the possibility that we'll go back to some material just before the midterm, especially stuff that we didn't necessarily cover in the midterm itself. Okay? You will not see, this I will guarantee, you will not see a midterm question again with different numbers. Okay? But you might see something that we covered that we didn't ask about on the midterm. I, if you were looking to put weights down on your <coughs> studying, I would say put at least three quarters of your time on post-midterm material and potentially one quarter of your time on pre-midterm material. As I mentioned, the goal is not memorization. Taking a derivative does not count as memorization. Okay? You guys should know how to do optimization. But besides that, there will be a lot of commonsensical stuff come up in the <coughs> true-false, and there will be um, writing out answers for the uh, longer answers. Any questions about that so far? The book will, all books will be, oh no, sorry, the books, the two books that were due before the midterm will not be on the final, okay? The two books after the midterm will be on the final. Those, those will show up in true-false questions. I don't think Mr. Uh, Manker Olson will be doing an optimization. Any other questions about that? <coughs> what? No, no blue books. Everything will be written on the pages we hand to you, okay? Same game as normal in terms of uh, test taking. Um, a lot of people are worried about the curve, their grades, so I'm going to say something about that. Uh, at the moment, the class average is 72%. That is a mean. Everybody know the difference between a mean and a median? Okay. The mean is 72. I am going to set the curve in the following way. It's going to be on the median, and the median will be at 80%. That means that half of the class, assuming now, this is what I mean, 
I don't mean that you're going to get a worse grade. Okay, if, if half the class is doing better than 80%, I'm not going to lower your grade. But if half the class is getting a 74 and below, I'm going to raise everybody by six points. Does that make sense? Okay, so if you have an 84, you're going to get six points, you'll be in an A minus. Does that make sense? Everybody understand that? That's the curve. Any questions? Yeah? Why would you do it on the median instead of the median? Just curious. Because uh, in the mean, people who have zero grades would drag down everybody. Right? In fact, would increase the curve for everybody. But we're trying to get rid of the outlier problem. Is the median of the class right now 80%? No. I don't know what it is, but it's, I can, I'll tell you what it is you know, when I send out the grades. Okay. But um, and another thing, oh, is Diana here? Did you see my email about grading on attendance and sections? Is that cool with you? Okay. I'm also going to pimp up your grade on section attendance. The way it's written on the syllabus, and I'm assuming that this is not objectionable, okay? And the syllabus, it says you will get um, 10 points if you have 100% attendance or you miss one section, right? And then you get five points. You drop five if you only have two or three absences, and you get zero if you have four or more absences. I'm going to change that. It's going to be much more linear, much more gradual. So zero or one is ten. Two is nine. Three is eight. Four is seven, and so on. Okay. So if you miss eleven sections, which I think is actually impossible, because you only had ten, you get a zero. Okay. Does that make sense? That's what we're going to do for grading section attendance. That cliff between ten and five is a little bit dramatic, and. Um, people that were being excused for doctor's reasons and all that stuff, um, they usually notified me, but if they notify GSIs, that will not count against you. Okay? All right. That's logistical stuff. Any open questions about anything new? Okay. Ah, now the briefings, as you, ha you handed them in today, and they're gone, disappeared. Um, we're going to, we're, as, as I've mentioned a million times, they're doing, we're doing peer grading. It is single blind because your names are on it. Some uh, uh, a student asked me, uh, said it was difficult to find uh, her post on the blog. And uh, as graders, you will want to look up the original posts. If they don't actually post, on the email I sent last night, I said you can put your original post date. Some people change the titles of their blog. Um, they're a good briefing, often because I mangled their titles because I tried to make it nice and fit into the line. If you need to find someone's briefing, type their name into the search box on the blog. Okay, That'll save you a lot of time. That's my hint. The other thing is that when you are grading, you're grading on the economic analysis in these briefings. Okay? So uh, just think like they're doing economics, you're doing economics. And as before, you want to do a summary, you want to say what you like, you say what you dislike, but put down your economic analysis of their analysis, right? Your responses to their responses. I liked this briefing does not count as, a, well, it could count as a pro comment, but I dislike this briefing does not count as a con comment, okay? You have to explain why. And that will have come up because we, the, G, the GSIs and I, will be grading your, your grading and making sure that you're doing careful economic uh, evaluation on an economic basis when you're doing your grading. As most of you hopefully found out, there was a lot of very thoughtful commentary on your briefings by the graders, by yourselves. And I actually felt that was pretty good. I don't know if some people felt it was unfair, they got the wrong grade because they don't deserve it or whatever. But um, the whole process of peer grading, in my opinion, uh, is, is a good exercise in learning about uh, how to, to be critical uh, readers, but also it's, it's learning about how to talk to each other, right, as your peer group. And I'll get into a little bit more about that. But it was, it was very, I thought it was very, very good in terms of the quality of the work that you guys were doing in terms of grading each other. And that was essentially my point. So I was, as, as I mentioned, it was an experiment, and I was very pleased with the results. We'll be doing the exact same thing. And remember, formatting, when you turn in your grading of the briefing, you're going to, what I'd like you to do is write the, the name of the person who you're grading on the upper right, just where it appears right now. Write your four-digit <coughs> SID up here, upper left, okay? 
you want two copies of each one, you want to staple your grading on top of the original. <coughs> if that does not happen, we, the graders, will take points off. Okay, some of you might have noticed minus one point because you only handed in one copy. That's because we had to go make a copy of your grading, and that's a pain in the ass. And if it's a pain in the ass for us, it's minus a point for you. Right? If you wrote it in pencil, you lost a point. It's a pain in the ass to read pencil, especially when I say type it. Right? Everybody knows how to type. I couldn't believe it. Actually, somebody copied their, their handwriting. That was pretty impressive. So, type it. You see? Does anybody have any questions about this? Great. No. So it's the first copy, then it's the original. No, the original's on the bottom. Two copies. Oh. Okay. Because we're gonna. What we do is we we grade your grading, rip that off. That goes back to you. The grade of that of that other person goes back to them. They're stapled together still. Right. That's the whole point. It's a paper flow problem. When we're dealing with 300 pieces of paper, we really have to watch what the hell's going on. Okay. As you guys saw, we try to hand these things back, and that's complete mess. Any other questions? I'm sure I'll get emails saying, oh my god, where do I put my SID number? But I'm just trying to nail this down as soon as possible. Right. Now, there was another, I had an interesting email from one of, our, one of your peers. And uh, he said, um, well, given that this is peer grading, and given that if somebody gets a better grade, how does that work? It's, if it's peer grading, then we're, being, we're grading each other, and if I give a bad grade to the other student, then my grade in the course will go up. That was the logic that was presented to me in the student, when the student wrote the email. So, he went on, what I should do is I should give the best briefing the worst grade, and the worst briefing the best grade, in order to uh, screw over the person who's doing well, so that they come down to my level, I guess, and now, actually, I have to say, this may not be his actual personal thought and action, but he was worried about other people doing that to him, which is a concern. You always worry about that other person. So, the logic would be to screw the person who did the best job, give them a worse grade, and then uh, give the worst paper the best grade. Now, I had some responses to that. My first response is that you as an individual will have no impact whatsoever on the total, because there's 270 papers floating around, or one out of 90, 190 if you can affect by this interesting method of grading. But the other one is, what would happen if everybody thought the same? When they handed in their, their brief, how would they write their briefings? If you're smart, you would write the worst possible briefings, wouldn't you? And then everybody would write crap. And I would probably have to fail all of you, right, for, for that strategy. Because then there's kind of this omnipotent problem, right? But, so the problem is that everybody would write crap. I'm, I'm actually, I, I, I forgot to ask him, given your strategy, did you write the worst possible briefing? But I don't know. I, hopefully he wrote something good. What I told him to do is do the right thing, give the best briefing the best grade, which is obviously uh, what works. And, I, and let me say a little bit more about that. And imp importantly, is this idea, this peer grading, actually relevant as a, is it my little uh, good idea? Or is it, or is it, uh, you know, my, 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 my fetish? Or is it actually, ironically, appropriate to this class? Right? This class is environmental, economics, and policy. Right? We were talking about, what's that book, the Manker Olson book? What's that called? The logic, of collective the logic of collective action. And your first briefing was what? How to solve a problem where you have, you're writing a briefing for a, a, a politician, and it's the idea is to help the, the many at the expense of the few. Right? Who's had section on Monday already? You guys played a game in the section. I'm not going to spill the beans for the people that are going to enjoy other sections, right? But in that game, you are learning more about collective action problems. This peer grading is actually one of the most applied collective action problems you can think of. Because if you go around and say, I'm going to screw everybody else so I can make myself better off, 
then everybody ends up handing in crappy briefings. And then the advance of knowledge is zero. Right? Now, the worst thing is, is that you might be doing quite well with respect to your peers in this class, but the kids over in Chem 192 who have managed to cooperate in producing a good outcome will come over here and destroy you all, right, in terms of tribal warfare. And I want you to think about why we have collective action, why actually our society has a very strong notion of what is fair, and very, very strong notions of, of dealing with cheaters, right, and uh, imprisoning them or punishing cheaters. And I'm not just talking about infidelity in the marriage, I'm talking about thieves who are killed immediately in the markets in India, often if they're caught, in other countries, right? The whole idea of our society is that we want to punish cheaters because the, the tribes in the, in the past, if you want, that didn't punish cheaters, they decayed. They all bickered until some other tribe came along and beat the shit out of them. And we're them. Right? The reason that our social evolution has gotten us to this point right now is because we've cooperated better than the other folks. And when it came down to war, you know, some of us went off to fight the war, and, and the other ones stayed back to take care of the, the household. And the people that went off and fought the war, the people that were back home, they didn't just like, you know, run around and eat all the food and, and screw all the women and say, you know, who cares about the fighters, right? When the fighters came back, they were heroes because there was cooperation, right? That is why we have Homer and all that stuff, right? And things that, if you will look at any kind of, of religious text, they emphasize the necessity of cooperating, right? Some people think that's because God told us to. I think it's social evolution. Right? This class and this grading mechanism is applied social evolution. And what I want you guys to think when you're doing this grading is, am I going to run this good essay down because I feel like it'll make my chances of getting a better grade better, or am I going to help my peer improve their knowledge and exposition so they go out and they do a better job in this world? That's why I'm doing peer grading in this class. I would probably do it if it was math, but it really applies in this class, right? The Copenhagen talks are in the news right now. Obama's going there with nothing except nice words. The Chinese say, we're going to try. The Indians are like, forget about it. The Europeans are tearing their hair out, right? The, this, right now, we are in the middle of the biggest collective action, uh, uh, applied collective action problem ever, right? Now, climate gate aside, it's been very interesting to follow that. Climate gate, what I was talking about with the scientists that were throwing away original data and leaving behind their smooth data to show their opinion. Those guys should be shot, right? That kind of stuff, besides that, there is, my belief is there still is a climate change problem. And, you know, even if there isn't a climate change problem, we still have endless social cooperation problems to worry about, right? If climate change wasn't happening, it would be war, it would be hunger, it would be something else, okay? So, Trust me, this is not just a, a one-shot game. So in that sense, this is very, very applied. And those of you who are feeling nervous about trusting your peers should use that nervousness as a learning opportunity when you go out in the world and you look at collective action problems. You say, oh, you know what? I was worried about my, my B plus A minus split, but maybe actually the whole idea of public transportation or paying taxes or voting is actually the same problem. And maybe all of these really difficult problems and the things that I was working on this class, I can work on uh, if I'm going to work on public transportation or whatever. So that's essentially, I think it was this, this email from this guy, it was interesting, but it got me to thinking, is this a complete waste of time or is it my fetish? No, it isn't. It's a very, very good pedagogical opportunity, right? And hopefully you guys are being pedagogued correctly in terms of learning what's going on. So... <coughs> That's a little speech. Any questions about that or other things? I will get into more collective action stuff. In a minute. Right. So do a good job grading. Make the world a better place. And go to section and play the game. I'll talk about the game next Tuesday. So let's get to an example. Oh, what did I put here? I'm going to um, cover just some jargon here so you have it. It was on the syllabus. Bounded rationality. 
is a very simple idea. It basically means that if you are a rational being and you're trying to calculate the cost benefit of any given action, that you're going to want to um, calculate the costs and benefits, but you're imperfect. You're not a supercomputer, right? You're sitting there trying to figure out, well, if I um, buy this can of tomato soup, the sodium is higher than in this can of cheaper tomato soup, lower, lower than this can of cheaper tomato soup, and I'll have more money if I buy the cheaper stuff, but there's more sodium, and sodium will lead to high blood pressure, and blood pressure can affect my life expectancy, and I'm thinking about having kids, and if I have grandkids and I have a heart attack, and I'm not going to see them when they play the baseball game, and there is a limit to how far you can go, right? You are bounded, essentially, by either time or uncertainty or risk in terms of figuring out what's going to happen. But what you do is you make a decision based on your boundedly rational thought, right? You basically have limits to how much you can consider at any given time on your table, on your plate. You have how much stuff you can put on your plate to think about, and you make a decision based on that. Bounded rationality essentially is a kind of an excuse for people making mistakes, which surprisingly they do. I put up a blog post last week about bubbles in financial markets, asset markets. If you've anybody anybody been noticing, there's been a bubble in the real estate market. Now I, I saw a headline today someone calling the bubble in the gold market. Gold is at $1,150 an ounce, I believe. And the whole notion, the research has been done on bubbles by other, today is going to be talking about the great work of other economists. And um, they've done research on in experimental laboratories, stuff that, the same kind of stuff that I do, based on forming bubbles and watching how they form and how they pop. And they're based on having a mistaken idea of the value of something. And someone just says, oh yeah, actually I think that's going to be worth more. They make their forecast, and someone else says, oh, you think it's worth more? Then maybe I should think it's worth more. And as you guys might know, the best thing to do in a bubble is to sell at the top. The problem is we almost never know where the top is, right? And, and, if, you, and, you, and if you sell against a bubble, if you're a short seller in a stock market, a short seller is somebody who bets on the price going down, if you're a short seller in an equities market and the price is going up, the, the higher the price goes up, the more money you are losing. Right? So if you're a short seller, you're thinking the market is overvalued, it should go down, but if the price keeps going up, it will bankrupt you. Right? Never bet against the wall of money. That's my little bit of stock market wisdom. So the thing is, is that bubbles do form because humans run and they, and they all collectively get into this kind of um, dream state of my house is always going to be worth more to, uh, forever and ever until suddenly the bubble pops and you turn around and everybody's house is worth 40% less. And you said, I should have sold at the top of the market. But usually you don't. You guys can figure out how to handle your own investment bubbles, but you should know that it's based on this the same idea of... Um, bounded rationality, making a mistake of calculation. And because we're all imperfect. You'll notice that most academic economists don't invest in anything. They have T-bills, but they talk a lot about it, right? It's like that's for the people out there to, to lose their money on. Well, most academic economists don't care. Um, I mentioned that cheater detection is extremely important. When um, when we play games, remember I mentioned to you the trust game where one person, person A, starts with $10 and then passes some of that money to person B, right? So X goes across and then whatever shows up is 2X and then B decides to send back Y. Remember that description? Yes? Okay, so as I, I mentioned to you that the normal thing, the best thing, of course, social optimum, is to send 10, 20 over here. That person says, I'll, hey, I, you trusted me, I'll trust you, I'll send back 10. That's a very common response to sending 10. But, as I, as I also mentioned, the autistic economist, the person who only took Econ 1, who doesn't get it, will say, if I trust that person, he'll keep all the money, so I'll send nothing. 
right? So they end up with 10, or with, I don't know if they get punished or not. Oh shoot, I forgot. Anyway, there's something wrong with sending zero. I think you don't need, oh, I know why. Uh, I said it wrong. It's called a, a dictate, uh, ultimatum game. A variety of the trust game. Let me start again. A variety of the trust game is called the ultimatum game. Person A proposes a split with person B. I've got 10 bucks. I'll give you 5, I'll give you 1, I'll give you 0.1, I'll give you 9. They propose a split with person B. And B either accepts the split or rejects it. If he rejects it, then neither gets anything. So the most common thing to do when playing the ultimatum game is that A will say, I'll give you five. And B will say, I will accept. And they end up splitting the money 50-50. See where I'm going there? Okay. I'll get back, I, 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 can, I can get back to this other one, the trust game, later. <coughs> when person A says, I'll send you a dollar, and Mr. B, as a rational economist, you should consider zero or one. <coughs> Which do you prefer? One. Remember we were doing those game trees? One dollar is bigger than zero. How often do people who are presented with a choice of one accept it? Anybody? Who would, who would say I would accept it if you were given, given one? Raise your hand high. I'll take one. Who says I'll, I will reject one? I'd rather have zero. Kind of half. It turns out that about 90% of people reject one. Because it's just not fair. Especially since, as you guys know in the, on the auction game, you just ended up with 10. You didn't even earn it. Didn't even deserve it. Right? When you play this game and the person actually has to work to get the money before they offer it, it changes the dynamics. But if you just say, Here's, you get 10 bucks and you, and you guys are playing the game, and you offer one, <coughs> most of the time she'll reject it, especially if it's anonymous. Right? Sometimes they might take it. But economic students who are trained in game theory might accept one, but those people, the world, the people with the ladder on their truck, those people will reject it. And here's the interesting thing. If you put a third party out there who is watching this game, or watching the trust game, and they are watching what that person is doing, usually the people know they're being watched, if you sit there and say, you've got five bucks just to do your job called watching, and you watch what A does, and if you want to punish A, you can spend a dollar to take two dollars away from A. Right? So when A offers a dollar, or some, some variety of offering the split, it's very common to see C punishing heavily. Right? He only offered a buck, I'm going to spend three bucks to screw that guy over. Right? I'll spend all five even. People will pay to punish other people. And this is, you know, you can go back to the, an eye for an eye or whatever you want to call it in, in, the, in the Bible or the Talmud or whatever. Every culture has a notion of punishment because cheaters shall be punished. I'm not saying this as any kind of religious thing. It's just... There, it's part of our uh, evolutionary psychology. You put people in the laboratory, you give them the opportunity to punish. Them. They will punish, and they love it. They put them under the under the CAT scan machine. They do brain waves, and they watch people cheating, and they watch their brain waves when they're cheating. People freak out. Their brains go what? Because they are really upset. And if you give them the opportunity to punish, them, put a gun in their hand, they'll shoot them. Right? Five dollars is nothing. They'll they'll shoot them. So I'm telling you, the cheater detection is a very, very strong impulse in our society. This is a little bit jumping the gun in terms of what you guys are doing in section, but it is important, and I have to bring it up. Depends. So you have to. Does that? The question is, does that defy game theory and rationality? Right. It depends what you put in this thing. Right? What goes into your utility? If you only care about I, me, right, then potentially you'd be like, five bucks, 
Fine, kill each other, I don't care. Right? And sometimes people, there was this famous example of the, of the woman who was being raped, I think, or killed or stabbed in New York in the 70s, and everybody just kind of walked by or didn't pay attention. It's like, oh, that's New York, right? And that can happen when people are, are alienated from each other. But, you know, go to the opposite extreme, go to the village. <coughs> If somebody, like, you know, takes a clothespin off your line, everybody knows, right? So, um, and it turns out that it, it, in those situations of, of a, a public uh, attack, that as soon as one person starts to move, everybody else kind of wakes up and starts to move. There's that first mover disadvantage. People are afraid. I, I saw this. I didn't, I, I heard about it. some cop, a bad cop, and there are some bad cops, went into a bar and started beating up the bartender, who was a woman. While all the male patrons sat there, didn't do anything. Apparently in Chicago, you do not contradict Chicago cops. Because the cops together will, as a group, they will coalesce around them, each other and defend each other. And if it turns out that you uh, die in custody under accidental circumstances, hanging yourself by a cop's belt, then uh, they will, uh, no one saw anything. The video camera failed for some reason. <laughs> It happens, you know? And, and, and that is actually, when you, when you talk about actually addressing power structures, this kind of stuff starts to matter because it becomes who watches the watchers. This is the thing that I pay a lot of attention to, right? Where do you, where do you address corruption? Yeah. But I thought that the, the case in New York with the woman um, being raped or whatever and nobody helping was more of a nobody feels responsible. I, I heard that with that, if you actually have a problem and you need help. If you approach one person, and only one, right. and say, I need help from you, you right. then that person will do something. But if you just say, general, help me, then right. nobody feels like there's no clear role, okay, it's your responsibility right. to right. punish. Right. Help. And it's the same thing. This person knows their job, right? But if you sit there and say, oh, actually, they've done this experiment too. Both C and D are watching. And they both have five dollars to spend on punishment. And they're both like, your job. So no punishment happens. So exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, they did this um, psychology experiment where they told people they were coming in to take a test, but really they were testing whether or not people would help in a situation. So they're taking the test and then in the other room the administrator like smoke starts coming out and there's like yelling from the room. And when there's a group of people taking the test, everyone just kind of freezes and sits right. there. But when there's one person, they go and help them with right. the Absolutely. Yeah, exactly the same thing. There was even something more ridiculous where there was a, a, a group of uh, seminary students, I think, were told um, something like, you have to go to building B. And half of them were told, go to building B and I want you to give a talk on the Good Samaritan. Right? I don't know, I, know, I only know the Monty Python version of the Good Samaritan. But some, someone who wants to help out someone else, right? That's the idea. And the other half were told, you're going to go give a talk about whatever. Sermon on the Mount or whatever. Wine and, wine, and wine and water or something like that. And they actually had, they sent them down the path. And then on the path, there was some dude who'd fallen down. Oh, my leg, my leg. <laughs> something like that. But they had, they had to get to building B on time. They were late, right? And the people that were prompted... That's called prompting. By the Good Samaritan story, stopped more often. I think they didn't. Of course, they didn't stop 100. percent They're like, "Well, do I'm in a hurry. You're you're like whatever, right?" So they would do that. <laughs> Seminary students, people in training to be of service to the community, and the people that were like going just giving a general talk, they're like, "Yeah, whatever, right?" And, and there's just less, fewer of them stopped, right? So there's a lot of things that matter in terms of cueing and and communication and lines and and you know. If you're thinking about this, not just in, as you go through life, but if you're designing mechanisms and you want to have impacts on, on social norms or environmental issues, think about this psychology and think about the economics. The economic, uh, what do they call it, uh, behavioral economics is just essentially psychology relabeled, repackaged. Right? So we are stealing a lot of good ideas from the psychology people. Um, so that's all about cheater detection. It's very important and it comes up a lot. Risk aversion. 
Important concept, I mentioned it to you, I just want to give you a small example of a real world thing with water. I realize that most of the semester I've kind of mentioned water now and then, and obviously it's my day job, I talk about water all the time on my blog, but this is a, I'm not going to, I'm not going to regale you with more tales of water screw ups, as far as I know. But um, there's a place in Southern California, my fabulous California map, down here, called Imperial Irrigation District. Who's heard of the Imperial Valley? Are you from there? You just got the laugh. All right. Anyway, so, Imperial Irrigation District, the Colorado River goes right around here, and um, California gets 4.4 million acre feet of water from the Colorado River every year. That's a, a legal entitlement. The river doesn't necessarily have the water, but it's ours. There's a problem with climate change. In California, a grand total of about 40 million acre feet of water is used for agriculture and, 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 and not environment, agriculture and urban use. Municipal and industrial, it's called. Ag, M &I. <coughs> this is about 20%, this is about 80%. I, I don't need to get into the, the whole long debates about those things. So about 10% of the water in California comes from the Colorado River. About 3 million acre feet goes to IID. And a little bit more goes to some other uh, agricultural areas. And the rest goes to Los Angeles. Now here's the key. You've got, don't worry about the names right now. No, just, you know, I'll just call it ID at all. They've got 3.85 million acre feet. The next 0.55 million <coughs> acre feet go to a, a big organization called the Metropolitan Water District. That's urban water. This is ag, this is urban. Okay? This is 4.4. And this is kind of a long story, but it's an interesting story. And um, so if there's a shortage, the urbans get cut first. Now, if you're sitting there going, what the fuck? That's okay. This is water. That's normal. <laughs> IID uh, was told you have to use less water because you're, you're, they, they're doing flood irrigation to grow um, alfalfa and stuff. If anybody's sitting there going, oh my god, growing alfalfa in the desert, this is it. These are the guys. So they were told you have to use less water. And the management of IID managed to do the almost the worst possible solution. I couldn't have thought of a worse possible solution. Because what they did is they told the farmers, the old days used to be use as much water as you want, that's fine, we'll just charge you for what you use. And then they're like, uh oh, there's not enough water. You have to use less than, uh, I'm going to say 5.5 feet. <coughs> so that means 5.5 feet of water. I'm not that tall, short. About 5.5 feet of water on a year you would put on your ground. That's irrigation. Right? An acre foot of water is 326,000 gallons. That, they, pay, they pay $20 for that. For 300 and... Next time you buy a bottle of water at the store, remember how much you pay. I figured it out. At the airport, it costs about $5 million an acre foot. <laughs> million, right? They pay twenty dollars per acre foot. So the, there's this difference in pricing between ag and urban. Yeah. Is the, would the water be fit for No, this water is well. It's fit for food, you know. But it's it's not strictly the quality difference. There's a difference in um, the rights to the water. That's why it's cheaper. The water in the airport not only is it bottled in some spring with uh, you know supermodels. <laughs> Did you ever see Colbert do the bottled water thing around the world? It's just insanely fun. Sorry. 
So bottled water is different because it's in a bottle, it comes from Fiji, it's cleaner a little bit, right? But this water is cheap mostly because it's very uh, strong property rights to get the cheaper water first. But regardless of that, they were used to paying $20 as much as you want. And then they were told, wait, you've got to put a limit. You can't use more than 5.5 acre feet. Now it turns out that agriculture is not a precision science. You don't go exactly up to 5.5 acre feet and then stop, or put it in your, in your holding tank, right? 326,000 gallons of water is a lot of water, right? So what the farmers are doing is they're running out, they're cutting alfalfa and they're irrigating, and they said, well, we can only, we can't, if we do three irrigations, we know we use between five and six. Whoops. If we do three irrigations, five and six, but if we go over, we're going to be penalized. They were told, you will be penalized, punished, bad, to go over that. So risk-averse farmers, what do they do? They only ran two irrigations. So like, you know what? I'm not going to run more than I uh, am sure to stay under my limit, and I'll run two irrigations. And that meant they were firmly below the 5.5. There was a lot of uh, uh, safety margin here. Now here's the interesting thing. This is where it starts to get more interesting. Because of risk aversion, they were, they were more conservative. They didn't run it up to the limit, right? Because they didn't want to pay that penalty. And the penalty might have been, instead of paying $20, it would have been like $30, right? But even still, they're like, ooh, $30, that's a scary number, right? They had a World War III trying to get from $20 from, from 17 It took them four years, I think. So the uh, farmers used less water, and therefore IID had a surplus of 200,000 acres feet of water. They used roughly 6% less. Now where did that water go? It went to the junior holder of water rights, the Metropolitan Water District. And Metropolitan values this water at roughly $200 per acre foot. So using these numbers, I think I used different numbers before. Using these numbers, IID kind of sent $40 million of water down the river. Those farmers would have loved to have seen $40 million of cash from selling that water to IID. <laughs> but they didn't because they basically just screwed up. They didn't say, we'll use less, we'll sell you the extra. They, they set this arbitrary thing here and the farmers responded by going below it. If you were doing your game theory, you would say, wait, if I set this limit, are the farmers going to hit the limit exactly? No, they're going to be conservative. If they're conservative, there's going to be surplus water. Where's that going to go? We're not going to store it. It's going to go down the river. Wow, maybe we should be clever and sell this water to M MWD before they get it for free. Except that they weren't that clever. So $40 million of water went down the river, and, and Metropolitan said, thank you very much. I'll take that. Right. Now the citizens of LA and they're and they're in San Diego and all that, they loved getting their lawns irrigated because they now they have greener grass. But that was an example of, if you want, of applied risk aversion in terms of and I call this a massive screw up. I actually think there might have been I'd have no no evidence whatsoever, but if I was met, I would have passed a few briefcases of thank you notes across the table. Right? Forty million dollars of water for free is quite a deal. So, that's an example of risk aversion. Is that clear? Any questions about that? All right. The last thing I want to talk about in my, in my key word process here is, oh, yeah. So, the, I mean, could the alfalfa sprout still grows well with the farmers? Because it seems kind of odd that they first use a lot of water, and then once somebody says, no, you can't use as much, they use less, and their crop would still grow as well. Then why no, no, they didn't grow as many crops. Only no, three cuttings. They only do two cuttings instead of three. So it's not that they lost the crop that they planted, they just plant less. They planted they less or they, or okay. they cropped it less. Yeah, alfalfa is a crop that you plant and, and you grow it. I, this is my non-technical belief. You, you cut it five times over five years, right? But you can do multiple cuttings and 
as much water as it gets as much as much as it grows. So if you don't water it, it slows down. So the other uh, key word here is on race. And let's change that to a, a more technical jargon, in-group versus out-group. <coughs> Dynamics. Race or stereotype or club, who's in my club? Who's my posse? Who's my tribe? They did this really interesting experiment where they um, put a bunch of students like you guys in front of uh, computers and they said, uh, pay attention to all the faces going by and we want you to um, remember who's in your group and who's not in your group. <coughs> And they put a bunch of white folks and a bunch of black folks going by on the screen. Who's on your team? And who's not on your team? <coughs> and lo and behold, when they ran this, and I'm, I'm slightly interpolating because I haven't read the, the, the paper for a couple of years, but the, uh, the, the result will be the same. They put the, the, all the, the white people who were in, participating as observers remembered that the white folks were in their team and the black folks were not on their team, and vice versa with the black observers. And it's clearly racism, or not. Because what they did as part two of this experiment is they put the exact same photos of faces, but they put jerseys on them, digital jerseys, right? Red, and, I think it was red and green or whatever. Red team, green team. And they scattered the jerseys across the uh, skin colors. And people completely ignored race when it came down to finding who their team was. Because they were paying attention to who's my team, not what the fuck the color of the skin of the person is. Right? Because it turns out, this is the evolutionary psychology explanation, is that we pay a lot of attention to stereotypes and race, in group, out group, because when we meet a stranger, it's like, wait, are you from my tribe? Are you going to kill me or should I kill you? <coughs> Team sports, if you ever go to a game, is the big game happened yet? Did we win? Yes. Awesome. <laughs> right? So we win, we hate St Stanford, right? We hate Stanford. They wear red. And we wear blue. And blue is better. Because that's our team. Anybody get into Stanford? Anybody? Did, and you didn't go? Oh, you're wearing red. <gasps> As soon as you go to Stanford, oh, suddenly you're Stanford, and who cares, oh, screw Cal, let's go screw the bear, or whatever they talk about. Burn the bear. Homecoming stuff, right? So they're creating a team dynamic. And sports are merely a refined form of warfare, aren't they? We're lucky that we have sports, and we don't have people shooting each other on the streets, trying to get a little ball. And it's, but it brings out that same kind of energy. Who's in my group? Who's in my group? The out group. Who's the out group? I hate the out group. Whatever the out group is. Right? And it turns out that the most obvious way to overcome long standing warfare between groups, the Crips and the Bloods, I suppose, should be mingled into one big football team to go beat up the Stanford Cal Axis. That would be an awesome game. <laughs> right? <coughs> and would that be a, a, a ludic game, or would that be a game? <coughs> right? You cannot bring your weapons onto the field. But it turns out that in-group versus out-group dynamics are based on very simple uh, observations. What's the color of the dude's skin? Or his jersey? Or his haircut? Or his mustache? Or whatever. Right? That's why if you go into... My girlfriend just flew off to Vietnam and she's going up into the northern tribal areas in Vietnam. Who's been in, a, who's been in Guatemala? Yeah? Vietnam, other tribal areas, tradi more traditional tribal areas. Have you noticed that everybody dresses in the same clothes? Because as soon as one village walks over to the next village, it's like, oh, you're a stranger. 
I can tell by your embroidery. Right? I was going around Central Asia and I was wearing a hat. And in Central Asia, they wear these little skull caps, like, because it's all Muslim. And I was wearing this skull cap that I got somewhere. And everybody thought I was from somewhere else. It's like, oh, where are you from? Where's your tribe? I'm like, well. And I had this cap on. And they all were looking at my cap, trying to figure out where I was from. Because if I, if I put on their cap, I'd be one of them, except for a lot of different problems, right? <laughs> <laughs> but there is this notion of the signal. Who, what, what team are you on? Pay attention to this. It's very important in terms of understanding some of the dynamics that we see out there. In terms of like, oh, the, who saw the, the, the um, South Park episode on the Prius drivers? I actually posted it on my blog. It's called Smug. Yes. We have a big coating of smug over South Park, right? Or San Francisco, yes. Yeah, the, the, the home of the smuggest people in the world. And, uh, and the people in the Prius, were, they, they go up the intersections like, I'm cool. You're cool. We're cool. We drive Priuses. Pri, whatever they're called. <laughs> and if you drive a Honda Insight, oh, you're not cool. That's an Insight, right? So there's this notion of, oh, you're on the same team and therefore you're cool. I remember this, there was a chemistry professor who was quoted. Uh, and he said, well, why do you drive a Prius? He says, well, I know it does nothing to save the earth, but all of my colleagues drive them and they wouldn't talk to me if I didn't drive one. And that was essentially it. That was your scientific explanation about why you should drive a Prius. So keep that in mind in terms of more stuff on social cooperation. All right, any questions on these things? All right, I'm going to get one of my favorite examples of a collective action problem. <coughs> I'm actually going to solve the problem, I think. So you'll be more interested in that instead of just complaining all the time. Hey, can you blip the thingy? The Congress tends to excel at writing, you know, wow, you thought that was bad. Watch this. But we've had a policy for a long time on sugar. CNH, pure cane sugar, what does that stand for? California. California and Hawaii, right? Now, Hawaii is, of course, in the tropics, and you can grow sugar cane there. But most of the sugar in the United States, sugar, comes from what? Sugar beets, right? But where does most of our sweetening come from in the United States? Corn. I fructose corn syrup. Now, it turns out, who's, who's had Mexican Coca-Cola? Anybody got the, the real thing, so to speak? It's made with what? Sugar, Sugar right? We make it with corn syrup. corn syrup. Now, why would we economists have corn syrup flavored cola? Cheaper. cheaper. Okay, it's cheaper. Cheap. <laughs> so we have cheaper ingredients. Now, if you're a cola manufacturer and someone said, I'm going to give you a cheaper ingredient, are you in favor of that, lobbyists? Say aye, right? Okay, so Coca-Cola loves the corn subsidy program. Who likes the corn? Do car farmers like the corn subsidy program? Yes. Yes, okay, good. Corn farmers like it. Now, these guys don't necessarily like the corn subsidy program, but let's treat them separately for just a second. Sugar in the United States is protected by, this is, oh, now we're going to do international trade. It's protected by a tariff. Oh, sorry, tariff and a quota. This is high fructose corn syrup? Sugar. That was a side bet. We'll be back here in a minute. Sugar is protected by a quota. And um, the quota essentially says that we, the U.S., will allow in a certain number of tons every year from certain countries that are given a piece of the quota. Does Cuba get a piece of the quota? No, we hate them. They're commies, right? Brazil gets a piece of the quota, yes? Because Brazil is one of the biggest sugar producers in the entire world. For better or for worse, we won't get into that. They happen to make it for ethanol. Whoops, here comes another thing. What do we make our ethanol out of? Corn. 
Corn. Oh, more things for corn. Who likes that? Corn <coughs> farmers? Say yes. Nice. Yes. All right. Okay, so here's what happened. Let's just go back as far as possible in time in a little stylized story. Back in the day of C&H pure cane sugar, they were growing, I don't even know, um, I think California might have been where the sugar showed up to and it was from Hawaii. Let's just say that's it. I'm, I could be wrong, and if somebody wants to do the Wikipedia research, that's awesome. So CNH was, was out there, and they were producing sugar in Hawaii. And then the Brazilians or whoever came along, or the Cubans, I think let's go back to the Cubans because this was actually before Castro, and said, oh, cheaper sugar from Cuba. Well, if you're a sugar farmer in Hawaii, or ironically Florida, or Louisiana, do you want that low-cost competition? No. So what you want to do is you want to put some kind of barrier, right? You can put a tariff, which is just a tax. It's a certain number of dollars per ton. Or you can actually be even more sneaky, and you can put a quota. Because a quota doesn't cost anything. A quota, a quota is free. So you've got um, Florida, Louisiana. Let's call these guys the axis of evil. And they want to limit competition from the foreigners. And they want to do it in a simple way. They say, look, you can, you can put as much sugar in the country as you can put in 100 million tons, or let's say 10 million tons per year. I don't even know how much sugar we eat, but it's a lot. Let's, let's just say 10 million tons <coughs> per year. You can sell into our market. And then if you put more than uh, that, you have to pay $20 a ton as a tariff. Now the price, let's just say the price in the U.S. is $15 from domestic production. The cost of domestic production is $15. Let's say that the cost of Cuban domestic production is $5 a ton. Now you know these numbers are wrong. But just for the sake of example. The Cubans could send in, and everybody else, can send in 10 million tons at $5 a ton cost. They sell it at the U.S. Uh, perfectly elastic market price of $15 a ton. If they sell more, they pay a tariff of $20 a ton. Are they going to sell anything? No, zero. Tw five plus 20 is 25. That's too expensive, right? So they're out of the market. So when you draw a supply curve, you basically have the foreigners coming in at $5 up to $10 million, and then bang, it goes up to 25 because of that tariff. And then let's just say that the U.S. can do something like, uh, let's do something like this. This is the U.S. supply curve. And then let's just say, and if I aggregate the two of them, I'm going to shift this over. So, da 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 da. Let's say this is the aggregate supply curve. Is that clear enough? Is there too many lines on there? You see what I'm doing? Okay, and let's just say that, um, you know, whatever. This is demand. <coughs> so the supply and demand cross here, right? <coughs> supply and demand cross there. The foreigners come in with this much market share, and the U.S. takes out the rest. Everybody got that part? Okay. Now, they, they grow cane sugar where they can, which is in Hawaii and Florida and Louisiana. And they grow beet sugar, where they can't grow cane sugar, but in the Midwest. That's where beet sugar is grown. In Europe, they happen to have a similarly stupid policy about sugar, and they grow lots of beet sugar in Poland and Germany and stuff like that. And they're protected from those nasty tropical <coughs> people in poor countries by their own set of barriers. So what we get in the U.S., is a mix of cane and beet sugar. And then because sugar goes into more products, it actually makes, I'm not going to draw a bunch of supply and demand curves, but you can imagine that it makes high fructose corn syrup cost competitive. Right? Because if your high fructose corn syrup, let's just say it costs $10 a ton of sugar equivalent. If you're keeping out the foreigners at their $5 a ton stuff, then your, the high fructose corn syrup market will exist. Does that make sense? 
So because the foreign sugar is too expensive to enter the market, there is a market for high fructose corn syrup, and that's why we use it in our drinks. Right? Solid sugar is used for other things. We use it for baking. If you go to this, if you, if you, if you price out a kilo of sugar at the store here versus a kilo of sugar in Brazil or any country that has free trade in sugar, you'll find that our sugar, I think, is two or three times the world price. Now, how much sugar did you buy last year at the store? Anybody buy more than 10 pounds of sugar? Big sugar eaters here? No? <laughs> Forget the Splenda crowd, right? Now, if you're, so there's 300 million Americans, and let's just say that all of them are paying an extra $5 a year, times 300 million. $1.5 billion of extra rent. There's a whole pile of money on the table. Who is getting that money in terms of higher prices? Which ones? U.S. sugar producers. Are there 300 million U.S. sugar producers? Let's just say that there's a thousand of them. Each of them making an extra 1.5 million dollars. Right? Are they a general interest group or a special interest group? They're a special interest group, right? They're making a million and a half dollars of rent, extra money, just because of protectionism. They spend a little bit of it bribing their congressmen to keep the tariff in place, right? I don't know if the Republican hold in South Cuba is based on a South, uh, South Florida, South Cuba, North Cuba, South Florida. I don't know if the Republican hold in South Florida is based on the Cuban exile community or the sugar lobby. Right? But there's a heavy overlap between these two. They keep their legislators sweet with bribes. That's a good pun, isn't it? I try. <laughs> so that's why we have the sugar tariff. All of us pay $5 extra per year. And you know, it's interesting. The businesses that use a lot of sugar, Coca-Cola, they use high fructose corn syrup because their product, they ship syrup around. And, they, and, their, and their final product is made in local plants and stuff like that. But if, what would be an interesting side effect, you would imagine? Who would think of, the U.S. price of sugar is very expensive. What would you imagine would happen in next door markets? Mexico and Canada. We know that Mexico uses sugar in their Coke. Let me ask you a different question. If you were a candy manufacturer, where would you put your plant? Canada. It turns out. There's a huge amount of confectionery made in Canada and shipped across the border, importing virtual sugar. Right? It's the same thing as the U.S. rice producers sending sushi to Japan to get around the rice tariff quotas. Because <coughs> sushi is not the same as rice. You get these kind of weird situations where all these Snickers bars or whatever the hell they are are being made in Ontario and shipped into the U.S. Ontario, Canada, instead of being made in whatever, Indiana or Massachusetts or whatever. So this special interest group is benefiting from this sugar tariff. And that is the small exploiting the large, which is what Nanker Olson was talking about. They have, you've got your, uh, and the corn farmers support that because that helps them out. They have a bigger market for corn, right? So you have this unholy alliance between corn farmers, sugar farmers, politicians, and, uh, and actually, the few foreign countries that get access to this tariff, because they don't sell their sugar in the States for $5 a ton at price, at cost, they sell it for 20 So they actually make rents also. And guess who gets the tariffs? It's not the Brazilians, the most efficient sugar producers in the world. What the U.S. should be doing is they should be auctioning access to that quota. But instead, we give it to our favorite political friends, Right? If you're a uh, commies, forget it. Cubans don't get sugar quota, but uh, Haiti does, or the Dominican Republic, or whoever's flavor of the month at the State Department. They get access to the quota. And that is how screwed up something will get. Oh, here's my favorite part. 
When you grow sugar cane in the tropics, in the wetlands of Florida and Louisiana, you farm the wetlands. What happens to ecosystem services? Who's heard that jargon before? Do those wetlands function anymore? No, they're turned into agricultural fields. So when a hurricane named Katrina shows up and attacks your coastline, and you've got no wetlands to absorb the blow, then the hurricane's blow falls more heavily on other places, including New Orleans. I really, actually, seriously am telling you that the sugar policy made Katrina worse. It made it worse because there was no wetland barrier to absorb the, the storm waves and the rainfall, etc., from Katrina. Talk about shooting yourself in your foot. Oh, and then of course we have subsidized flood insurance, so people will build in floodplains because it's cheaper, right? That's another brilliant move. All these things kind of come together. One, they call it a perfect storm. It's a perfect fuck up of policies, right? Every policy goes wrong at the same time. Sugar, subsidized flood insurance, uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers straightening channels for shipping, right? And nature comes along and says, oh, I'll just blow you up. And those hurricanes, were hap they've been happening for a long time. I'm not even going to talk about climate change. And we made it worse by distorting the system in order to deliver some rents, basically. <coughs> That's sugar. Any questions? My opinion, but I think it's pretty sound economics. Yeah. Like I guess it's a really difficult thing because um, I can see like why people would just like want to maximize their profit and stuff. I guess like is there anything like more that you can do besides like I guess changing shifting the policy that would like like just drive the mindset so that they're not like screwing over people in other parts of the world for like profit? After long and careful analysis, the only thing I figured out is the only way to, to fix these problems is to not have the government make the policies in the first place. It's kind of one of those Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. <coughs> and, um, you know, it's, it's the same thing as banking. Banks being concentrated and concentrated and concentrated. So there's many, many, there's very few banks, few big banks making very big bets and then blowing up. And ironically, when we had thousands of banks, you know, individually you have idiots in charge here and there. And the banks would fail here and there. But not Citibank or AIG Bank like fucking up on a colossal scale, hundreds of billions of dollars, right? Because they got that big. So it turns out that when you channel power through the government, if you don't have, uh, there's this quote from the Federalist Papers, uh, and it's actually in favor of government, right? If men were angels, there would be no need for government, right? But then you put the government in charge, and sometimes you don't have angels going on there. So it's, I mean, the one thing I'm watching is when are we going to repeal the ethanol program, which has no environmental benefits, creates massive distortions in terms of agriculture, displacing not just food crops but other crops, corn from food to, we, we, the corn we put into ethanol is more than like the entire production of Australia, or something huge, right? There's the environmental problems of all the dead zone that's in the, the Gulf of Mexico of uh, the Gulf south of New Orleans. All of that from agricultural runoff. So like, when are we going to end the, the ethanol program, which clearly has no benefits in terms of net carbon reductions, and it's producing a, a small income bump for those farmers. It's like, can we just pay them money? Right? I think, I think the simplest thing to do is just pay the farmers money. But it turns out that the politicians like to pretend that they're delivering something important so they can steal from the taxpayers <laughs> And it costs, it ends up costing a lot more. It costs about, you know, for every dollar the farmers get, it costs five dollars of distortions. And it'd be like, just, okay, fine. Just give the money to the farmers, but don't, don't waste my five, don't burn five dollars for every dollar. That's the tricky part. No one will be honest about it. It's tough. Well, how about, so you're saying that all the policies in place, like, this is a giant cost of action cost of pay. There's 350 million. Five 
It's one of those things, if, if every person in this country, not every person, that's not even true. If a hundred people in every congressional district on a daily basis started hassling their congressmen, there's 435 congressmen, is that right? Or 535? I don't know. Senators and congressmen together is 535, right? 435 local reps. A hundred people, and they serve an average of, of less than a million people each. But a hundred people each hassle their staffers every day about fucking sugar then that would end it. The problem is that the $5 in benefits that you're going to get are is less than the costs. So you literally have to be missionary about it. Like religious. Like, I don't even care what it costs me. I'm going to take this down. And that would be awesome. Right? I'm, uh, as a side note, because I told you I'm only lecturing for this class and I'm going to go off and do other things, I think I'm going to go into politics. And I'm going to politics and I'm going to start yelling all this shit outside, out loud all the time. On the right. Huh? On the right. No, but it's going to be interesting, right? Because it turns out that the, the biggest, I mean, solving these collective action problems, but I'm like, I can't be an economist. i got to go do politics, which is really a dirty, dirty business, right? But I can't wait because it's going to be a learning opportunity. Talk about learning opportunity. You guys are in a learning opportunity. Wait till I'm on for Congress this week. <laughs> All right, so let's um, stop now. Is Diana, where's Diana? Let's uh, do this paper reading.